Hello, everyone. Welcome to our class on the ABC of Contemporary Capital with David Harvey. We are so excited to be hosting this course currently virtually because of uh, the pandemic. My name is Tahia Islam. I'm with the education team here at the People's Forum. Uh, physically, we are back open to the public. So please come and visit us, visit our bookstore, 1804 Books. Um, the ABC of Contemporary Capital is a 12 session course to survey Marx's political economic writings, how far it succeeded, and how the findings illuminate our current contemporary condition. Um, in this course right now, we are joined by students from CUNY, so welcome. Um, so we have folks who are currently in this class um, and welcome to everybody who's watching the live stream. I'm going to ask that if you have questions, you can put it into the YouTube um, Q&A and comment section. And the same goes for those of us in the Zoom room, you can put your questions in the chat. With that, I am going to pass it over to David um, to get us started and, and introduce himself. Okay, I guess I'm unmuted, finally. Okay, great. Good, good. Okay, well, what I um, uh, have in mind in this uh, class is to go over uh, some of the basic ideas coming out of uh, Marx's political economy uh, and uh, to try to develop a mode of understanding them which is as simple as possible. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I've had in mind all along has been to try to create a situation in which uh, people can easily understand uh, what Marx was talking about and why he was talking about it. So I've, I've tried to simplify, but without being simplistic. This is, this is very difficult. So one of the things I'm gonna rely upon you to do is to tell me when I'm being too simplifying or too simplistic and when I'm being uh, making too much in the way of assumptions about what it is that you can understand and what it is that people can understand. Um, so that's, if you like, the idea. Now, I'm doing something a bit unusual in this class. Um, and in fact, I'm going back to the roots of what I did many years ago. <clears throat> and my, my partner asked me this morning, how many years have you been teaching and giving classes, and I came up with the figure 61. So I have given 61 years worth of classes uh, in my lifetime, which is actually a bit uh, astonishing. Now, when I, when I started um, teaching, I always wrote out lectures. That was what we were supposed to do. And after about three years, I decided that was for the birds. It was no good. It was just terrible. So I threw all my lecture notes away, and then after that, I used to wing it and sometimes it was great and sometimes it was a disaster but but it always seemed to me that it had a certain kind of authenticity to it and I've done that pretty much ever since but in this class I've done something different I've actually written a text for this class uh, and in fact I'm going to be writing 12 texts for this class and I've already got about three or four of them, and I'm gonna, gonna uh, work with these texts, and I'm gonna read them to you and with commentary. And at the end, I'm gonna put the text on my website so that anybody can read it. Uh, and in a sense, uh, uh, ask for comments on it, on how difficult it is, how easy it is, or it's interesting, and you know, in other words, uh, this is kind of a bit like crowdsourcing <laughs> A lecture, if, if you like, put it that way, and and so that's the uh, that's that that's the basic idea. So the way I'm where I'm going to organise this is I, I I give the the basic lecture, if you like, for the class, which should take me about anywhere from half an hour to forty minutes. Then we'll have some discussion, uh, but then the following week I would like to uh, have a discussion on the, the what we've done in the preceding week. In other words. What I, what I talk about this time, I would like to come back after you've read the text and gone through the reading and, and then sort of give some comments on, the, on the, written, uh, the written version. And then next week we'll do the first about half an hour of the class will be a discussion. 
of the written text. Then we will we'll stop and I'll give you the next text uh, and have a very brief discussion about that. And then the next text we will do the following week in the same way by you coming back uh, and talking about the, what you've learned from the text, uh, what you think of the text and, 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 and the like. So this is, if you like, the way we're going to do it. Um, I, I, I think this is, I'm finding this quite, quite interesting as, as an idea. And as I say, it kind of uh, helps me because one of the things that is difficult to do is uh, to render Marx's arguments uh, easily understandable without, you know, turning it into a kind of a simplistic little discussion. So this is this is the this is the the, the very general idea that that that, that I have. So. Um, well, so what I'm going to do now then is to is to start with uh, the, the the first uh, the first text, and in the first text, the the, the 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 preceding part of it is this that I have, if you like, from Marx, uh, a mission statement, and the mission statement reads like this: it's uh, it's, a, it's a quote from Marx, uh, which comes from his uh, Grundrisse text which was uh, written in 1857-58. And uh, he lie, outlines exactly what his mission was, and this is what my mission is going to be also. He says this, the exact development of the concept of capital is necessary since it is the fundamental concept of modern economics, just as capital itself is the foundation of bourgeois society. The sharp formulation of the presuppositions of the capital relation must bring out all the contradictions of bourgeois production, as well as the boundary where it drives beyond itself. So that's my mission. I want to get to an exact development of the concept of capital with all of its contradictions and all of its you know, problems. So that is uh, the mission. But Marx around that time, just a couple of years before, wrote what was seen to me a very compelling account of the context. And I thought it would be interesting to say, well, okay, what is the context in which he's asking these questions about the exact development of the concept of capital? And this is the context he describes. There have started into life industrial and scientific forces, which no epoch in the former human history had ever suspected. On the other hand, there exist symptoms of decay far surpassing the horrors recorded of the latter times of the Roman Empire. In our days, everything seems pregnant with its contrary. Machinery, gifted with the wonderful power of shortening and fructifying human labor, we behold starving and overworking human labor. The newfangled sources of wealth, by some strange weird spell, are turned into sources of want. The victories of art seem bought by the loss of character. At the same pace that mankind masters nature, man seems to become enslaved to other men or to his own infamy. Even the pure light of science seems unable to shine, but on the dark background of ignorance. All our invention and progress seem to result in endowing material forces with intellectual life and in stultifying human life into a material force. I find that a wonderful kind of statement. I think that it captures for me anyway, very much my feelings about the current situation. Never have we had such wonders of technology. Never have we had so much access to all kinds of, I don't know, foods and things of that kind. Never have we had such fantastic scientific understandings. Yet we also seem to be lost in this infamy, we seem to be lost in terms of the, the science shining on a background of, of incredible ignorance. I, I don't know, so Marx is writing this in 1856. And it seems to me that if he's writing that as, if you like, the, the context in which capital, which capital has produced and which capital produces, then one of the things we have to do when we try to get the exact development of the concept of capital is to ask the question, how is it the capital produces contexts of this kind? And so this is, a, if you like, 
as something that goes on and stretches from 1856 when Marx wrote that to the situation right now. And that seems to me to be the, if you like, the, the mission statement and the context put together, which frames what I want to do in this whole class over these 12 sessions. I want to try to answer that question. How come capital, with all of its brilliance, all of its fantastic achievements and everything else, has produced a situation where we are actually lost in infamy and ignorance and all the rest of it. This is, if you like, the major feature. Now, this then gets me into the situation. And this gets me into, if you like, the prologue to the whole exercise that I want to go into. And the prologue reads like this. I'm really trying to get a map of the investigated terrain. That is, all right, if we're going to understand capital, what are we, you know, roughly where, where are we looking? What would we look at to do that? Because if we look at, you know, contemporary economics or contemporary political science, we'll get an answer which is, it seems to me, totally inadequate. We have to have a, a map, if you like, of what it is we're looking at and why we're looking at it. So here's what I've been writing and what I've written. If the mission is to construct an adequate representation of capital, replete with all of its contradictions, then an elaborate theory must be constructed that captures how capital works and what it does on the ground. This entails a certain strategy of inquiry, communication and presentation. In the absence of the controlled experimental methods available to the natural sciences, we have to rely upon the powers of abstraction and theory construction to accomplish this mission. Historical materialism is, as some doctors like to say about medicine, a science with a sample size of one, i.e. the historical geography of capital. Since the very mention of theory intimidates many readers and the necessity of working with abstractions is problematic, the claim it is too abstract ends many conversations, I begin with a simplified and I hope easily graspable picture of what capital looks like as a working totality. This enables me to set up at the very outset a sense of how the elements or moments, as Marx prefers to call them, of the capitalist economic system, such as production, labor, wages, profit, consumption, exchange, realization and distribution, hang together within the totality of what capital is all about. Marx prefers the language of moments rather than events or anything else in order to capture the transitoriness of everything that happens within the totality. Now, conventional economics typically conceptualizes capital as a thing-like factor of production that capitalists use when combined with land and labor to make another thing that can be sold for a profit. Marx, on the other hand, defines capital as a process of circulation, which at various moments takes on different material forms, such as money, commodities, production processes, and the like. Marx's emphasis is upon the processes and the moments rather than on the things. The process thing distinction will frequently return to animate the analysis in what follows. And I always suggest to people, do you live your life as a process or do you live your life as a thing? Actually, life is a process, but we find ourselves represented by the state and even in relation to each other as things. So this thing process analysis is very important. And Marx tends to diminish the significance of things in favor of emphasizing very strongly the importance of processes, those things which are in flux. While the idea of totality undoubtedly derives from Hegel, Marx reworks it and revolutionizes it as he does almost everything else taken from Hegel. For Marx, the totality is an ever-changing network of historically specific social practices and relations built and evolving, in this case, through human action. 
This network is constantly in the process of growth and transformation. Perpetually, and this is one of Marx's favorite words, perpetually becoming, as Marx puts it, even as it exhibits certain proclivities towards solidity and permanence. Marx's concept of totality is therefore open, evolving, self-replicating, but in no sense self-sustaining, given its internal contradictions and its penchant for breakdowns. Capital creates, as it were, a complex ecosystem of capital flows in continuous historical evolution and formation. But Marx mainly limits his inquiries to what he calls the inner structure of the totality of capital. This inner structure, you will be able to see from one of the diagrams that I, I sent out earlier. While capital may be the driving force, the foundational process within bourgeois society, Marx recognizes that it does not say everything that needs to be said about capitalism as a social formation. The theory of capital as a mode of production is one thing. The theory of capitalism as a social formation is quite another. Marx mainly focuses on the former, that is on capital as a mode of production. But he does surround this inner structure of the mode of production with critically important contextual conditions that link together conditions in the social formation with the dynamic laws of motion operating within the inner structure of the mode of production. Depictions of this sort are not unusual even in the exact sciences. In the book I did last time, Marx, Capital and the Modernist of Economic Reason, I use the hydrological cycle as a useful analogy. The cyclical movement of HTO, H2O entails transformations of form rather like those that occur in the circulation of capital. Water in liquid form in the oceans evaporates with the heat of the sun and moves as vapor upwards until it condenses out as the droplets that form clouds. As the particles merge and become heavier, they fall to ground as precipitation. Once returned to the surface of the earth, some of the H2O passes directly back into the ocean. Some of it gets stuck on high ground and in cold regions as ice that moves extremely slowly, if at all while the rest flows downwards across the land as streams and rivers with some water evaporating back into the atmosphere or under the land as groundwater back into the oceans. En route it is used by plants and animals that transpire and perspire to return some H2O directly to the atmosphere through evapotranspiration. There are also large amounts of water stored in ice fields or underground aquifers. Like capital, not everything is in motion at the same pace. Glaciers move at the proverbial glacial pace. Torrents rush downhill. Groundwater sometimes takes many years to travel a few miles. The model, this model of the hydrological cycle depicts H2O passing through different forms and states at different rates before returning to the oceans to start all over again. This is very similar to how capital moves. It begins as money capital before taking on commodity form passing through production systems and emerging as new commodities to be sold, monetized in the market. And the monies are then distributed in different forms to different factions of claimants in the forms of wages, interest, rent, taxes, profits, before returning to the role of money capital once more. There is, however, one very significant difference between the hydrological cycle and the circulation of capital. The driving force in the hydrological cycle is incoming energy from the sun, and that is fairly constant, though it oscillates a bit. Its conversion into heat has in the past changed a great deal, plunging the earth into ice ages or phases of tropical heat. In recent times, the heat has been increasing significantly due to entrapment by greenhouse gases, largely arising out of fossil fuel use. The total volume of H2O circulating remains fairly constant or changes slowly measured in historical as opposed to geological time. As ice caps melt and underground aquifers get drained dry by human uses. In the case of capital, the sources of energy, as we shall see, are more varied. And the volume of capital in motion is constantly expanding at a com compound rate because of a growth requirement that derives from profit making. 
the hydrological cycle is closer to a genuine cycle. Whereas the circulation of capital is, for reasons we will soon explain, a spiral in constant expansion. But the two totalities of the hydrological cycle and the circulation of capital are in certain respects joined at the hip. The massive increases in the use of fossil fuels deriving from the requirement for endless growth and accumulation lies at the root of the increasing heat retention on planet Earth, which, if it continues at the present rate, will ultimately render the Earth uninhabitable for most, if not all, forms of human activity, in part because of water deprivation and heat exhaustion in many regions. I then use a different analogy. The totality of capital is in some respects like a human body. So this analogy will ultimately prove misleading because an ecosystem comprises many organisms in relation to each other, whereas the human body is just one organism amongst many. But the human body circulates blood through the heart, oxygen through the lungs, ingests energy through the digestive system and the stomach, deals with waste through the liver and kidneys, while Coordination is exercised through the brain as a central nervous system. Each of these different circulation processes is autonomous and independent in certain respects and, and subject to specialized knowledge in the forms of cardiology, neurology, gastroenterology, urology, etc. But all of these circulation processes are subsumed within the logic of the human body and its laws of physical reproduction as a totality. It makes no sense, when you think of this, to assign a hierarchical structure of importance or causality to the interactions and interrelations between these different circulation processes. The failure of any one of these threatens the life and existence of the human body. There are, as we will later see, multiple ways in which capital can collapse into crisis. And in this regard, I'm taking a rather special position of saying there are multiple sources of circulation multiple forms of crisis within capitalism, as opposed to the general Marxist presupposition, there, there is only one mode in which crisis can be created or experienced. In the Grundrisse, Marx offers a description of the totality of capital as constituted by way of several different independent and autonomous circulation processes. Marx first looks at the circulation of commodities and money. Not all money is capital, but money circulates whether capital is there or not. And commodities circulate whether capital is there or not. Capital is money circulating in a particular way. Money becomes money capital through its encounter with and purchase of the capacity to labor as a commodity. Money capital is used first to purchase the capacity of labor, labor power along with commodities that furnish material means of production, raw materials, partially manufactured components, plant, plant and equipment, machinery, etc. These inputs are inserted then into a labor process, the technology of which is under the control of capital to produce a new commodity, which is the property of capital. Thirdly, the monetary value of the new commodity is then realized through a sale in the market that recoups the original monetary outlay, but adds a profit for capital. And then the money realized has to be divided and distributed in different factions, depending upon their claims. Some of it goes to workers in the form of wages. Some is taken in the form of taxes going to the state. Interest goes to the financiers. Merchant profit goes to the wholesalers and retailers as intermediaries. And rent flows to the landlord in return for the use of the land. The industrial capitalist who organizes production gets whatever is left over. This distributed money power can be used in two ways. A part of it will go to purchase commodities to consume so that the workers along with the capitalist factions and state employees can live. The other part is brought back together often with the help of banks and other financial institutions to reinvest as money capital which then goes back through the circulation process all over again. This gives us a picture of the inner structure, the distinctive circulation process for capital in general. And I've sent around this 
general picture when you can trace it on that uh, figure. This circulation process is not pre-given or predefined. It is not some ideal type waiting to be revealed or discovered, nor is it fixed to determine it with respect to its reach in space and time. It has something that has been and still is in the course of being historically constructed and reconstructed through continuous human social practices. There is a far broader ecosystem within which this arbitrarily abstracted totality called capital has its being. Hence, in the figure I uh, distributed, we see the metabolic relation to nature and the construction of a second nature through urbanization and the building of physical infrastructures along with the production of space and place relations. These are all contextually significant to the more narrowly defined and bounded model of capital circulation within the inner structure. The same can be said of capital's relation to human knowledge, social relations, culture, and tradition in existing populations, to conditions of social reproduction, and to the constant shaping and reshaping of the wants, needs, and desires of populations that get expressed through the diversity of human consumer preferences. What happens in the realm of social reproduction has huge implications for how the circulation of capital proceeds. But there, uh, much that happens in the course of social reproduction has little direct relation to the circulation of capital. All things occur in cultural activities and, and so on within social reproduction. They're on, if you like, marginal to what the circulation of capital and the inner structure is about. Lastly, and this is going to be one of the big issues I'm going to have to confront in this class, the state's role in accumulation cannot be ignored. Its tentacles stretch far and wide within the inner structure of capital, and as we shall see, a case to be made that the capitalist state, or at least significant elements within it, is a foundational form of capital itself. In other words, part of state power, as is also the case with social reproduction, is internal rather than external to the inner structure of the circulation of capital. There is a mythical account of capital being created purely by capitalists, collectively dragging reluctant states along behind them. But from Bismarck's Germany, Meiji Japan, the military dictatorship in South Korea, the state-led revivals through the Miti organization in 1960s Japan, state stented development in De Gaulle's post-war France and the old neoliberalism of the post-war West German state. In all of these instances and many more, state-led capital accumulation has been in many respects and is the, in the vanguard. Even in the United States, Hamiltonian politics and state-led initiatives on land distribution and land grants to the railroads and the like played a critical role. State-sponsored capital accumulation in China since 1978 confirms the point. So what I want to do then is to bring the state from that position which it usually is in in Marxian theory, which is something which is outside of capital accumulation, which occasionally kind of comes in and does something because somebody calls upon it. I want to change that and say, capital is inside of the inner structure from the very beginning. And right throughout, what we will find is that capital and the state are intertwined, but not the whole state some aspect of the state. And I increasingly will look on things like the Federal Reserve, the Treasury Department to say, that's the part of the state, which is internal to the dynamics of capital accumulation. And I would like to remind you that Adam Smith's major treatise was the wealth of nations and not the wealth of capital. The wealth of the state, he argued, could best be achieved by allowing the free functioning of capitalists in a price-fixing market economy. Smith was giving advice to statesmen, not to capitalists on how wealth could be created and captured by and within the state through market action. It is in this context that the otherwise mysterious title of Giovanni Righi's book on Admiral Smith in Beijing makes sense. It gestures to what happened in China after the liberation of market forces in 1978. 
the significance of state-led accumulation has not, of course, been without its contradictions. And processes of class formation, racialization, and gender discrimination within the state have just as easily led to arrested development of capital rather than accelerating growth. The innumerable state links and bridges to the institutions and life of civil society often produce antagonistic currents within the wielding of state powers that check and regulate rather than facilitate the ambitions of capital. I think of Cedric Robinson's book on arrested development as a good example of exactly this. The ambitions of, of nationalists, socialists and monopolists compete within the corridors of the state institutions with those of capitalists. The totality of capitals in a structure exists within the much broader totality of capitalism as a social formation. It's a bit like Russian dolls, there's the inner structure as a totality, that outer structure is also a totality, but a totality defined in a different kind of way. Marx's reason for conceptualizing such a distinction between social formation and mode of production is that he sees capital as the economic engine, the foundational powerhouse, the source of the abstract forces to which all of us who live under the regime of capital are willy-nilly obligated and bound to some degree. The general form of capital's inner circulation within the social formation are depicted in that diagram that I circulated to you. This is the picture of the inner structure within the totality of the social formation. We need to keep this picture in our heads as we probe deeper and deeper into the details. That is, when we're starting to look at a particular kind of question, immediately the question is what is its location within this totality? So we start with the idea of the totality and we then start to use that as a way of locating various features such as what labor supplies about and the like. So this is the tactic which I'm adopting, which is very different from the way in which you would build an understanding in conventional science. You build typically a sort of an architecture starting with firm building blocks and then other things on top and you build it that way. And this day I'm starting with the totality and then working back inside the totality to try to understand what goes on within it. So we need to keep this picture then in our heads as we probe deeper and deeper into the details. Now, there is a need to interject here an important political comment. The Hegelian legacy has long posed a serious challenge to the history of Marxist thought, particularly with respect to the way we might view a concept like totality. Now, I'm not a philosopher or an expert on this, and I'm just gonna take a bit of a, a, a sweeping generalization here. In the Hegelian idealist, albeit dialectical tradition, the totalizing forces make it difficult to imagine any socialist escape from the prison house of bourgeois formulations and capitalist practices. The only option seems to be blowing up the whole system and starting from scratch to build something totally different. Such revolutionary extremism appears neither feasible nor appealing, particularly in our day and age. For this reason, some Marxist thinkers, such as Lukács, gave up on the concept of totality entirely while others quietly buried it. But Marx's concept of totality as an ecosystem invites consideration of the internal mutations, the innumerable seeds of alternative practices, the openings at every level to doing things differently, establishing different social relations, cultivating alternative patches of human practices in Zapatista, Chiapas, in Kurdish Rojava, in the recuperated factories of Argentina, in the communitarian and collective agrarian practices sprouting in all sorts of places around the world. There are plenty of abandoned spaces and places and derelict zones within this ecosystem to experiment with anti-capitalist alternatives. While capitalist and bourgeois practices are overwhelmingly hegemonic, particularly in the centers of political and economic power. The possibility to cultivate alternatives is everywhere apparent. This is the nature of the ecosystemic model which I'm proposing. The seeds of an alternative socialism 
are liberally scattered around the world and from time to time they fall upon fertile ground. This would be virtually impossible within the constraints of the Hegelian conception. We have to lay to rest at the outset, therefore, the idea that the concept of totality is so totalizing and limiting as to make the construction of alternatives almost impossible. Strangely, this opening does not in itself threaten the perpetuation and dominance of the bourgeois and capitalist ecosystem. Indeed, the evidence suggests that the openness and the indeterminacy within the ecosystemic totality, that is capital, contributes mightily to its reproduction capacity and long-term survival. It allows for the cultivation of all manner of impulses towards renewal often accomplished through crises. Marx, for example, recognized that the perpetual renewal of the capitalist class by absorbing fresh and dynamic elements within itself from elsewhere has played a crucial role in the reproduction and perpetuation of capital's class power. While Henry Ford was a key figure in the 1920s, it is Jeff Bezos today. Many of the innovations for which the capitalist tradition is justly famous have their origins in the entrepreneurial openness of capital's ecosystem, as well as in the socialist impulse to explore alternatives come what may. The evolution of social media, for example, was initially as much driven by emancipatory impulses from the left as by commercial or sub military concerns. This openness to all manner of innovation inevitably creates the cracks through which the light of a socialist alternative can perpetually shine. Marx's Grundrisse is structured as an inquiry into the different circulation processes that produce and support capital as a totality. Here is a list of what these are. Elaborating on them, we have. First, the circulation of commodities through exchange. The circulation of money as money, commodity monies, coinage, fiat monies, regulated by the state, etc. Three, the circulation of money as capital. Four, the circulation of cap capacity to labor. And I've given you a figure uh, uh, which describes that. Five, the circulation of capital as fixed capital and the consumption fund. I have a diagram for that, but I haven't circulated that. The circulation of interest-bearing capital, private debt. The circulation of tax revenues and of state debt, which is seven. So you have seven circulation processes which are comprising what the capitalist totality is all about in exactly the same way that the human body has a number of different circulation processes that define what the human body is about. The overall circulation process of capital can in fact be disaggregated in other ways. In volume two of Capital, Marx distinguishes between the circulation of capital as money, the circulation of capital as commodities, the circulation of capital through production, and the circulation of all three forms taken together. These are the first four chapters of volume two of Capital. Marx's point here is to show that the form capital takes opens up radically different possibilities and opportunities for the capitalist on the ground at the same time as it imposes certain constraints. When capital is in its money form, for example, it offers all sorts of open possibilities for redeployment and mobility across sectors and regions compared to when it is locked into acts of production that may require heavy investment in immobile plant and equipment that cannot be moved without the devaluation and destruction of capital. A capitalist industrialist may have a steel plant valued at $10 million, but that is a very different from a capitalist armed with $10 million in cash, who can use it, as did George Soros, to bet on currency exchange rates so as to quadruple his money capital in one week. If money is the butterfly form of capital, and commodities are the caterpillar form, then production is the chrysalis from where value and surplus value are integrated. In volume three of Capital, these technical features are enriched by the emergence of class factions. Merchant capitalists concentrate and specialize around the circulation of commodities in the market. Finance capitalists and bankers concentrate on the money flows and industrialists concentrate on production, much of which is locked into place 
by sunk investments. While it is true that the industrialists operate at the heart of the creation and production of value and surplus value, the same cannot be said about appropriation. Merchant capitalists can, in certain circumstances, dominate appropriation, exercising the power of monopsony, as do Walmart, Ikea, Home Depot, and the major shoe and clothing brands. Even electronics operates this way. Apple, for example, dominates at the front end of design of product and operates in part as a merchant appropriating much, if not most, of the surplus value at the sales end. In between are Foxconn and a whole supply chain of part makers and produce most of the, that, who produce most of the surplus value in Asia that Apple appropriates in the United States and Europe, as well as in China. In automobiles, on the other hand, the producers hold the power mobilizing a network of dealerships and financiers, financiers in their service. General Motors, for example, created a whole finance unit to extend credit, which ultimately devolved into General Motors Acceptance Corporation as an independent bank. The power relations between these, these different factions are fluid and contingent, depending upon sector and geographical situation. Plainly, since the 1970s, Capital in general has witnessed a shift in which the merchant and finance factions have expended their power at the expense of, have expanded their power at the expense of industrial capital, though unevenly. One measure of this is to look closely at the sectors from which billionaires emanate today, as opposed to yesteryear. In volume two of the Grundrisse, Marx also examines the circulation of fixed capital, including infrastructures for production and investment flows into the consumption fund, houses, hospitals, schools, roads, etc. It is clear that these forms of circulation have become far more prominent in contemporary capitalism than was the case even in the 1970s, and certainly was the case in Marx's day. Marx also studies different working periods and turnover times, with chapters on speed up and the like, followed by chapters on the circulation of variable capital as wages, and surplus value is profit, culminating in the modeling of circulation relations between capital and labor in a macroeconomic setting. Reproduction schemas presented at the end of volume two, it is now acknowledged, were one of the first coherent attempts to build a macroeconomic model of the capitalist economy as a totality. Conventional economics only got round to modeling this in the 1930s. Marx was doing it in the 1850s, the 1860s. The boundedness of the totality, the definition of the totality, both structurally and geographically, as Marx construes it, is to some degree arbitrarily imposed by the investigator of the ecosystem, even where there are strong concrete conditions that logically support a particular definition of boundedness. In the case of the human body, to follow on with this analogy, there are strong reasons to treat of it as a working totality for purposes of medical investigation, diagnosis and analysis. But the general social conditions in which that body operates cannot be ignored in any approach to health conditions in society. While, for example, a cause of death might be very specific from the medical standpoint, the social context of substance abuse and opioid addiction, of alienation and social anomie, and all the economic and social reasons that lie behind these phenomena are of great significance to understanding recent trends in morbidity. The analogy of the human body within the social order usefully extends to the idea of sovereign state economies within which some hard and fairly fast rules are established for policy formation and the regulation of capital flow and labor provision within an open but bounded territorial organization of the interstate system. It was only in the 1920s that data began to be collected as if there was such a thing as a national state economy. The behavior of each sovereign state within the interstate system depends upon political and economic conditions, as well as upon the forms of collective action organized for the defense of state interests, which extend beyond simply that of accumulating economic wealth and power. The effects of interstate competition and geopolitical strategizing upon the health and productivity of capital in general are of great significance. In Marx's conception of capital's totality, the emphasis is upon the fluidity, instability, and creativity of the processes that sustain and create it. 
In the Grundrisse, Marx strives to come to terms with this becoming of capital as a totality. And I read you what he writes in the Grundrisse, just to make the point, hammer the point home. A totality, this organic system, notice organic system itself, as a totality, has its presuppositions and its development to its totality consists precisely in subord subordinating all elements of society to itself or in creating out of it the organs which it still lacks. This is think, a terribly important idea, the way in which capital colonizes and monetizes certain things and does so in terms of uh, everything from, you know, cultural acts and personal fitness and all the rest of it, monetizes everything. The way in which within this totality, things get subordinated to all the elements of society and get subordinated to the, to the will of capital. This, says Marx, is historically how it becomes a totality. So it's the becoming of this totality which we have to study. The process of becoming this totality forms a moment of its process of its development. This society then seizes hold of a new territory, e.g. the colonies. Interesting. Okay, the totality is growing and building, but at a certain point it spills over its borders and it therefore has, has to uh, move in space and colonize spaces around it. The diffusion, I say, of capital's productive forces and social relations across the whole world then follows. And Marx makes the point many times that the creation of the world market is foundational within the capitalist imperative, no matter whether produced through colonial occupations and imperial impositions of a way of invisible threads of multiple networks of commercial interactions and money capital flows. The crystallization out of various features within the totality can, on the other hand, guide, inhibit, imprison, or exacerbate the processes that historically constitute it. This crystallization, objectification, can from time to time become downright sclerotic with respect to ideas as well as practices. It then appears as if humanity has imprisoned itself in its own web of social class relations, ideological configurations, and institutional arrangements such as the law and customary practices to say nothing of remarkable physical built environments. It constantly finds itself straining to break the bonds and barriers that it itself creates. This is the foundational contradiction within the capitalist mode of production. It is the contradiction that invites the idea of a transition to an alternative socialist mode of production. It also invites us to consider the role of crises in the renewal of capital. Crises, and I quote Marx here, are never more than the momentary violent solutions for the existing contradictions, violent eruptions that re-establish the balance that has been disturbed. That is, crises are the way in which you get back on track. There is one further foundational question that has to be posed. As we have already seen, capital takes on multiple forms, commodities, productive activity, money, as it circulates. This poses the question of what is it that these different forms or moments have in common? What renders them commensurable and convertible into each other? Marx's answer is that they are all, in one way or another, reflecting something important about the qualities and quantities of human labor applied in their creation. And Marx calls this quality value. While all commodities exchanging in the market are valued in terms of their relation to human labor, not all products of human labor are commodities. If I prepare a tacos, tacos lunch for family and friends on Sunday, then that entails the application of human labor. But it entails the production of a use value, and not of value. It is therefore, in Marx's definition, unproductive. If I do exactly the same thing on Monday for sale in a restaurant, then the tacos have potentially both a use and exchange value. Their value is realized through a sale to a consumer. Out of this comes the proposition, which is very important to Marx. Labor with the same content can therefore be both productive and unproductive. Now this language of productive and unproductive is problematic. I don't like the idea that I'm being unproductive when I make dinner for family and friends. But Marx's definition of productive is anything which produces 
of surplus value for capital. In other words, it is production of capital because capital is surplus value capitalized. And therefore, productive activity internally to this dynamic of capital is about the production of surplus value and the production of capital. And anything that does not produce capital is unproductive and defined that way. Now, emotionally, of course, we don't like to, be, to think of ourselves as unproductive, but Marx gives us a rescuing idea in uh, Capital, where he says, you know, to be a productive laborer under capital is to experience a misfortune because you're being productive for somebody else. You're productive for them, not for you. So this difference between productive and unproductive labor is crucial to Marx, but it is not defined by the nature of the production process. There is, as Marx points out, plenty of room for ambivalence in this distinction. And I read you something now from Marx about how this distinction works, which is very appropriate, I think, for what we're doing in the class. He talks about Milton. Milton, for example, who did Paradise Lost, was an unproductive worker. In contrast to this, the writer who delivers hack work for the publisher is a productive worker. Milton produced Paradise Lost in the way that a silkworm produces silk as the expression of his own nature. Later on, he sold the product for five pounds and to that extent became a dealer in a commodity. But the Leipzig literary proletarian who produces books, e.g. Compendia on Political Economy, at the instructions of his publisher, is roughly speaking a productive worker insofar as his production is subsumed under capital and only takes place for the purpose of the latter's valorization. A singer who sings like a bird is an unproductive worker. If she sells her singing for money, she is to that extent a wage laborer or a commodity dealer. But the same singer, when engaged by an entrepreneur who has her sing in order to make money, is a productive worker, for she directly produces capital. A schoolmaster who educates others is not a productive worker. I am not a productive worker. Uh, but a schoolmaster who is engaged as a wage laborer in an institution along with others in order through his labor to valorize the money of the entrepreneur of the knowledge mongering institution is a productive worker. Uh, that's what uh, Donald Trump tried to mobilize in Trump University. In writing this text, I'm an unproductive worker and I can claim the same imperative that leads the silkworm to produce silk it is in my nature to do it. But when a publisher takes the content and turns it into a book for sale in the market, then I may receive a royalty for permitting the publisher to use my content to generate surplus value, profit. Value gets created in the first instance through the application of living labor and production for sale in the market at a profit. It gets represented and realized in circulation and consumption. Value courses through all the different moments. Its initial measure is given as socially necessary labor time, i.e. the time on average taken by labor to produce a commodity ready for market. This definition of value needs at this point to be taken on faith. It is the immaterial in the sense that it is impossible to cut a commodity open and extract the value from it. Yet it is objective because if, if I take the commodity to market, no one buys it then the labor embodied in it is socially unnecessary and hence not value. Value is a conceptual abstraction of the sort familiar across the sciences and the social sciences. We cannot measure gravity directly, but infer its existence from its effects. We cannot measure the political power of someone like Donald Trump directly, but we can infer its existence because of its effects. Capital is not an objectified thing as in conventional economics but a process of value in motion. It passes through the different moments of money, commodity, production, consumption, and distribution before once again appearing as money capital. The speed of its motion is constantly changing. In the course of its motion, capital exhibits the capacity to expand itself, to be the fount of the profit, the lust for which powers the whole system ever onwards. This leaves us with the final conundrum. Where does the increment in value, surplus value, come from? This is what grounds the profit which capital appropriates and what drives the whole system. And that is what we will talk about.
next time. Okay, so that is my lecture. <laughs> um, we can have, like I say, it will be put on the web and you will get a copy sent to you. So read it and then we'll can work on it. Who has maybe some reactions or wants to, to take up some issues, elaboration? Maybe, maybe I should do one thing. Uh, I've used the concept of totality. Uh, in Marx's work, it comes up uh, or, uh, again and again, just briefly. But in the, in the Grundrisse, it's foundational. In other words, when you're reading the Grundrisse, you come across the concept of totality all of the time. Now, there are a lot of commentaries on the Grundrisse, and hardly any of them, or none of them that I, as I know of, really take up the question of the use of the word totality in the Grundrisse. And I think there's one very good reason for it, which is that there was all this stuff that went on around, you know, uh, post-structural theory and Foucault and so on, which was antagonistic to forms of discourse which were considered totalizing discourse. And uh, now the word totality fits with totalizing discourse, which fits with totalitarianism. And so there's a lot of us possible associations here. So people ran away from the concept of totality, in part because those who held it were holding the Hegelian version, which is impossible, but in part also because there was this kind of post-structuralist antagonism to any totalizing form of discourse. And Marx was seen as an example of totalizing discourse. Well, it is a discourse about the totality. And it uses the concept of the totality to try to understand how it is that we are locked into certain situations which, which we do not freely and easily true, you know, choose. That we are, as Marx puts it, governed by abstractions. And this is what Marx is trying to reveal. So I think that, if you like, the general current of thinking within, this, within academia and all the rest of it was very hostile. Uh, to totalizing discourses. And I would also argue in many respects, quite properly so. But then when you throw out and, dis and, 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 and don't use the concept of totality, you're actually disempowering yourself. And the Marx does it in this way. And it is not a Hegelian totality he's talking about. It is an ecosystem. I, I, I wish that he had actually encountered the literature and ecology which was beginning to be born around the time when he was writing, but he never got around to, 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 to seeing it. If he had, I suspect he might have used the ecological organic uh, model for his thinking uh, more than he does. But in the Grundrisse, he's using this notion of the totality throughout. And the totality is very, very important. And I'm taking up the question of the totality when I'm probably going to get into a lot of trouble for it. Um, you know, because people won't, won't like it, and uh, will start to say, oh, totalizing discourses, totalitarianism, blah, 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 blah. That's not what's going on here. But I can't control the nature of the dialogue that's likely to follow. Amazing. Thank you, David. Um, in regards to any of the materials for the course, we'll have a clarification um, for the students here, as well as those on the live stream. And for those of us who are here in the Zoom room, feel free to come off mute to ask any questions or provide commentary. Um, and, or you can put your name in the chat for Stack. So um, yeah, go ahead, you can come off mute, Derek. Hey, thank you so much, David. Um, just quick, I, do, I did just reread Negri's book on the Grindrissa, and he does write a bit about the totality, although I didn't understand it totally, but it does seem to actually like part of it jive with what you're saying and that the totality is open. Um, and it's, he says that the Grindrissa is a work that strives for totality, but isn't a totality itself. Um, anyways, so, and then I have a question about what you were talking about a bit earlier on. Are we talking, are you talking about states, nations or nation states? And, um, I'm wondering if uh, like Marx's work on list um, factors into this. 
Uh, and I, I'm thinking of that because I just read a piece by Radhika Desai about that. Thanks. Yeah, no, I think uh, um, Part, part of the problem with, with presenting Marx is that Marx talks about the things that he is directly interested in and he knows, and he refuses to speculate very much. Um, and what, what he often does is, is to say, okay, there's something here that's very important, but I can't deal with it here because I'm not in a position to deal with it yet. And if you look at the various designs he set up for the Grundris, in the Grundrisse for, for his process of study around capital, the state is always in there. So he was going to deal with the state sometime or other if he got round to it, but he never got round to it. Now, bits and pieces of it come through with things like uh, Liszt and, 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 and so on. So he begins to, to touch upon these things. Uh, he touches also upon uh, uneven geographical development in, a, in a tangential ways. I mean, he talks about you know the relation to India. He talks about uh, things of that uh, things of that kind. So he, he so he never actually worked out exactly what the role of the state was, and, and he didn't really work out uh, very well the whole kind of question of finance capital either. So you have these, these two elephants in the room, really, about the state and finance capital, which, given the corpus of Marx's work, they are not integrated into the inner structure. But I don't see how you can actually evolve the understanding of the inner structure without somehow or other incorporating something about the financial system, the circulating interest-bearing capital, and something about the use of state power and the legal system and all the rest of it. So, so, so at some point or other, I have to go beyond Marx. And as, as Negri said about the, you know, the, the Grundrisse, there, this is Marx beyond Marx. <laughs> and and I, I mean, I don't like to put it that way because I think that what, what, what Marx is doing is, is to set up things up to a certain point, but he's left these other questions dangling. So the, the, the question of the state is going to be bothering me a lot. I'm going to have a whole session, obviously, on the state down the line. How I'm going to do it, I don't know. I'm going to get into a mess with it, and I'm sure people are going to get outraged or upset about it and so on. But, you know, somehow or other, we can't sit there and say that capital is working perfectly on its own and somehow or other is a perfect model of it working around, and then at some point or other, something called the Federal Reserve comes in and intervenes because capital's gone into a mess. Well, but no, but the Federal Reserve's been there all the time, you know. <laughs> so what? So, so somehow or other, we 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 have to have to deal with that. And I, I think this is a this is going to be a very you know very touchy kind of thing. And I can do the best I can. And I, I'm not going to say I'm going to be right. I'd probably be wrong, but but we have to take a we, we have to take a jump at it and be prepared to speculate about what it is that Marx might have come up with. Uh, had he got round to actually writing the stuff about the, uh, the, what the role of the state was, what the role of the law was. He has, has some good things about that in general about bourgeois society, but that's about bourgeois society rather than about circulation of capital and the inner structure of the circulation of capital. So I'm interested in, 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 in attacking that kind of problem. So I kind of, you know, I see where you're coming from and I'm thinking, well, now, okay, okay, this is, this is very interesting kind of problem we've got to, we've got to deal with. I have a question from chat. Um, David, are you able to clarify the productive and unproductive issue in relation to workers who work for capital versus workers who work for the state? Yes, Mark, so has this um, distinction between productive and unproductive labor. <clears throat> uh, within the unproductive labor that are not directly producing uh, surplus value for capital, there are certain activities which are what Marx calls the full fray, the necessary costs of, of production and circulation. And some of those necessary costs are being worked up uh, are born within the state apparatus, but also 
uh, Marx kind of argues that uh, retailers don't add any value. They don't create value. They simply appropriate value and pass value on. In other words, value is, 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 is uh, about the act of, act of production. So there are a lot of, so, so Marx has, if you like, a threefold distinction. There's, 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 the, there's the kind of labor which is, has nothing whatsoever to do with the circulation of capital. There's a sort of labor which is about the production of surplus value directly. And then there's a labor given over to necessary costs of production and necessary costs of circulation, which includes some, but not all state functions. Uh, so so the, un the unproductive is divided into, if you, if you like, necessary and unnecessary forms of unproductive labor for the system to work. Can I ask a follow-up if anybody else doesn't have a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I am wondering about um, the relationship between the nation and the states um, in terms of the circulation of capital being the circulation of the class, you know, class antagonisms, which are uh, also take national forms. Um, so like, in, in, I mean, and, and I understand that this isn't integrated into capital or as far as I, I mean, I think maybe the London notebooks talk more about this, um, but, you know, like in terms of the organizing uh, for the Irish liberation struggle and, you know, the, the idea that at first, you know, the, the Irish could only be liberated after a socialist revolution in England. And then after experiencing the sort of national chauvinism amongst English workers, you know, they changed their position and said, yeah. well, no, we have to fight for the self-determination of, of the Irish. So I'm wondering where that fits into this, to, to, the, to the project of understanding capital, but also um, abolishing capital in, uh, yeah, like what's the relationship, if you're thinking about this between national liberation and socialist revolution? Yeah, that's a, another, another big uh, kind, of, kind of question. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the, one of the things, uh, it goes back to the former question about, about the state also. One of the things that uh, Arig, Giovanni Arrighi and, and Brodel brought up was this idea that, that there is a, a way in which the state is capital. And Arrighi made much of the fact that what differentiated Europe from everywhere else was that everywhere else there were empires which were sort of hierarchically organized. In Europe, there was an interstate system and there was fighting going on. In other words, there was competition between states in ways that wasn't gonna go on inside of the, uh, you know, the, the, the Ottoman Empire or the, in, in, in the Chinese imperial regimes or, uh, or the Mughal Empire and so on that, 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 that one of the things that 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 when when you get to the question of Adam Smith writing a text for for statesmen saying, well, you know, if you're in competition with other states, uh, wealth and power is going to be one of the basis of your competitive advantage. And if you won't win at wealth and power, you the only way you can do it is by actually creating a, 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 a capitalist class, in effect, a market system and an entrepreneurial kind of system. So, so Adam Smith is taking that kind of position. Now, the question of then the, the relationship of the, of the state and how that then becomes captured by the nation, idea of nation, I personally would want to differentiate between the state and nation because most states, it turns out, are plurinational. And, you know, in Ecuador and Bolivia, they've gone out of their way to actually say they're plur plurinational. But even the British state is plurinational. In Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales and England. You look at Belgium, it's, you know, you just go around all of these states and, they, and, and, and to call them a nation state seems to be a, a, a bit crazy. And, and, and I think to call the United States a nation state is kind of crazy. I mean, it's a state in search of a nation, if you like. And a lot of the states which were carved out of Africa with, uh, you know, colonial possession, 
But the, that, that then gets, gets back that the whole kind of question of the, the spatial organization and the territorial organization, which is necessary for certain kinds of administrative structures to, 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 to take place. And, and interestingly, you see, the, the Catholic Church was very, very good at doing this. One of the things it did was it, said, it set up a whole kind of system of, of uh, uh, bishoprics and parishes and so on. I mean, it, it was a sort of hierarchical kind of organizing of space so that you could administer the space. And when you get to this point of, uh, of the creation of the world market, which Marx is very much about, then you've got the question of, well, okay, you're creating the world market. Well, okay, merchant capitalists can go in there, but at some point or other, there has to be something organized there, which is gonna support what the merchant capitalists are doing, in which case the state institutions become terribly important, no matter whether they are part of some sort of, can be identified as quote, national or not. So there's this kind of confusion between uh, nation and state. I'm, I, would, I would want to argue what is necessary uh, for a capitalist mode of production to work very well is to have an interstate system, which is, which is highly competitive, which suggests that world government and capital are completely incompatible. That would be my view of it, okay? That therefore you need competitive entities which are going to be fighting with each other some way or other. Now, that then gets layered into a lot of these other aspects of cultural forms and nations and so on, and it becomes, you know, part of the nation you know, or kind of nationalism stuff, which I, I don't think is particularly pro-capitalist. In fact, it's likely to lead into uh, arrested development, forms of arrested development, because the idea of nation is going to be actually uh, superimposed upon, in some cases, dominant over this, this, this idea of a capitalist class. And, 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 and this is one of the dilemmas which are emerging in China right now as to in what, in what ways can the Chinese economy develop uh, when the, 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 the capitalist class is beginning to emerge and the, the, the party is suppressing the capitalist class. Uh, by you know, putting Jack Ma, dis disappearing Jack Ma, doing those things and cutting down on all of the uh, the power which is which is which is there. So there's a there's a very interesting kind of relationship here. Obviously, nationalism. There are many other things. That, as soon as you're talking about a state organization, then then the whole kind of question of the the state bureaucracy and how the, the, the is a, is there's a is there as Marx said about the United States a political class. And if there's a political class, what's its interest? The interest of the political class is to keep its power and not necessarily to make capital function very well. To keep its power, it has to keep some branches of capital. So, so yes, the, the, the whole kind of question of state governance and so on uh, confuses a lot of, a lot of, these, a lot, a lot of these things. Um, and there's no simple way, uh, it seems to me, uh, around that. But I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do, one of the things I want to do is to try to ask the following question. What forms of state power are really foundational and necessary, necessary for the laws of capital accumulation to work? That, that's sort of where, where I'm at. Now, when it comes to the social formation, uh, all bets are off, all kinds of things can, can go on. And I think it's very interesting that Marx never used the word capitalism. I use the word capitalism to refer to the social formation. Marx always talks about capital, never about capitalism. And what capitalism is about, as opposed to what is capital, two different questions. But Marx is very clear that he's interested in capital and I'm interested in capital and that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to do. I'm trying to bound my totality, if you want to call it that, where I kind of say, okay, I bracket off all these questions about national identity and how that you know, gets into politics and what happens when, when you get this kind of um, Northern Ireland kind of question uh, arising and, and, and religion enters in and uh, nationalism enters in, what, you know, well, those are the things that are happening in the social formation and they're terribly important. We want to know well, what, what they are and, and we have analyses of them. But what I'm concerned with is the inner structure. To what degree can we isolate the inner structure of capital accumulation? Uh, and, uh, and, and 
get an idea of its laws of motion because there are things happening uh, at that level which I think are to me terribly you know terribly important and in part inform why it is that this system which is creating such incredible possibilities is so completely fucked up I mean it's it you know this is this is this is the issue uh, it seems to me is that need, 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 I'm trying to address and like any kind of researcher I have a certain objective and I bound what I'm doing in certain ways and that question of okay what to do about national identity and how it enters in is I think um, you know and of course the, in these days it's, it's very difficult to do what I'm doing because everybody wants to talk about everything else in a social formation which I'm not opposed to I really am not opposed to the problem I have is when people talk about everything else and neglect if you like the laws of motion of capital and what capital is doing and because that, that is what I think I can contribute and what I would want to contribute to. Feel free to come off mute. Okay. Um, Robert? Yes. Um, hello. Thank you, Professor. Hi. Hi. Um, the on the question of on the, the circulation, the idea of circulation and this idea of a totality, which is takes the form of an ecosystem or like a set of a complex of interrelated systems. Do you understand or see the, the circular form of that capitalism takes? Do you do you think that that is a form which is characteristic of parts of the ecosystem that are not cap the capital circulation, especially the question of um, the surplus capital as surplus value capitalized, right? The, the sort of the, the idea that I always found very compelling in Marx that value comes from labor. And is that, is that limited simply to the capital aspects of this of, of the of the ecosystem or is that sort of what the dynamic that makes it all kind of you know um go i guess well i i guess the I, it's an, an interesting how to formulate that the way the way I, I i tend to think of it is is that Capital is hegemonic over certain spaces, but it's never it's never completely dominating any of the spaces, <clears throat> and and therefore there are these possibilities, um, you know, which you 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 see uh, developing. I mean, the economy of the United States over the last six uh, the last couple of years, vast amount of food has gone free to large segments of the population. Now, this is not a very capitalist enterprise, you know, you look at it and you kind of say this is, you know, and, and obviously uh, the uh, NGOs are developing all kinds of food banks and things of that sort. So a great deal of supply is going on through all of these things because the, the market system is, uh, has collapsed, in some areas has collapsed. And therefore, we, we, we have these alternatives emerging and arising and, 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 and the like. So I, 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 when I'm looking at it sort of geographically in terms of the spaces and within which uh, the capital is working, yeah, uh, it, 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 it exercises certain powers over things. I mean, I, I, I think of Okay, what, what, what are the sort of things it has been doing? Here, here it is in, in uh, the United States, and here it is in New York, and what, what, what are the things that the capital is doing? Well, one of the things it's built recently is Hudson Yards, which I would consider a wasteful, total monstrosity of nonsense. <laughs> it's, total, it's total bullshit in terms of, even in terms of revenues, you know? It's, it, it's just a basic... Uh, and that's going on at the same time as people are in, in, in incredible want and need. And you're kind of going, oh, you know, this is, this is, this is ridiculous. And, and it becomes even more ridiculous when you find out about the financing of Hudson Yards, which was largely financed by 
money which was invested by foreigners in return for a green card. Now, if you invest a million dollars in some, you know, in some uh, enterprise in the United States, you get a green card. That's, I think it's a million or maybe it's, maybe it's half a million, I don't know what it is. But in order to do that, they have this legislation that says that you, you, you need to invest in an enterprise which is helping a dilapidated area, okay? So they carved out a, a gerrymandered a, an area, which is a lot of the Bronx went through Central Park and then dog legged over to the Hudson Yards and said that is a, uh, and when they added up all the population in there, there was a tremendous needy population up in the Bronx and so on. So they ended up with a, 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 a administrative district, which is really totally gerrymandered which allowed all those foreigners to invest a million dollars into the into the into the Hudson Yard. So they so so so, so this thing gets produced this this kind of way and you're kind of going, oh well just leave aside the fact that yes they needed a lot of money up in the Bronx, but it all ended up in you know on the west side there. You know so so you you're you're looking at this situation and saying, well, you know, these crazy things are going on by 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 capital, and the sorts of things I'm worried worried about is not only Hudson Yards, but you look at urbanization in the, the Gulf states and everywhere. I mean, it's just sort of sort of, sort of sort of crazy stuff. So so this is a this is where the laws of capital. Uh, uh, are operative and there has to be movement on the ground by administrative structures and legal things and all of that to create spaces within which they can operate so that a space was created uh, in Hudson Yards where this could go on and it was the biggest real estate operation in the United States and one of the biggest in the world and it's still going on so 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 when we're dealing with capital we're not dealing with something which is dominant in the sense of it. it, it, it it's uh, it's a, a, an energy system which flows in certain kinds of ways, but neglects elsewhere. I mean, the, the joke of it is that the only thing that's worse than um, having too much capital around is is not having any capital around at all. In which case, you're completely neglected. So, so the idea of an ecosystem um, is, is appealing to me because it allows me to say, well, okay, there are, in any ecosystem, there are sort of spaces of indeterminate where nobody, nothing much is going on or where the fauna and the flora are so weak that they can easily be absolutely overcome by an invasive species coming in and doing something new and different. So when I'm talking about ecosystemic uh, totality, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it like, uh, well, okay, there's lots of divisions of labor, there's lots of production going on and different divisions of labor and, and activities and so on, uh, but they all have to cohere in some way or other at some point or other. And what capital does is to utilize those possibilities. And when I said at the end that the fact that everything, so, many, so much is open, that, that is terribly important for capital. I and mean, one of the reasons that Imperial China never managed to develop all of its uh, proto-capitalist uh, technologies and all the rest of it was, was because of a dominant power which, which, which prevented it. And that is why the interstate system starts to become very important and why the ecosystemic model starts to become important because if you don't have different ecosystems competing with each other, then, then, then the system itself is likely to gum up and, 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 and become frozen. I mean, look at, I mean, just when I, when I kind of say, look at, for example, the speed with which something like Apple grew from almost nothing to where it is now. It's a three, it's a $3 trillion company, the biggest company ever in the whole of human history. And, and how did that happen? How did Amazon go, was founded, what, 1974? Didn't have any profit whatsoever to about 2000. And now look, at, I mean, we live in this very, very dynamic kind of thing and capital doesn't care about a lot of details. All it cares about is allowing those kinds of transformations to occur. Uh, 
we have a question for you from the chat. So um, as knowledge and tech knowledge workers, tech producers, accumulators have taken over from industrial producers, how has that changed capital labor relations at all? Yeah, I'm not a great fan of uh, what has become to be called uh, cognitive capitalism and the like. Um, you know, capitalism has always used knowledge and, and, and the, the question is, and this is in part one of the things that Marx is talking about when he's writing about the context in the way he does, uh, that um, the knowledge uh, has always has always been there, and it's therefore been very much part of uh, what what you know what what happens. And then knowledge does get incorporated into the machines, and it does get incorporated into into things, so that uh, we live in a world where there is indeed automation and robotization and artificial intelligence and uh, things of that sort. But the point here is that the knowledge is only significant when it is used to do something. I mean, if we start to say all knowledge is a commodity, which can be, you know, then, uh, you know, I, any scribble anybody makes anywhere is, as it says, is, 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 is part of capital. Well, it's not. Knowledge for capital is that aspect of knowledge which can be utilized for the production of surplus value. So yes, it's very important to have the knowledge, uh, but until it's applied in the, the production and extraction and appropriation of surplus value, then it, it, it's not productive activity. Now, what happens, and this is, is, is about Marx's definition, is, is that it's a floating definition, so that something that looks like it's not, you know, not productive can at some point or other be picked up and utilized and made productive and, 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 and productive in a different kind of way. I mean, one of the theses, which I, I will get around to much later is to say, look at the turnover time of that exists in consumption. A lot of the time now we actually consume not goods, but experiences. In other words, there's a form of capital out there, which is selling us experiences. It's a Netflix economy, if you want to call it that, you know, binge watching and all the rest of it. I mean, this is a tremendous economy. Netflix is one of the biggest <laughs> corporations in the United States right now. And it's risen to that within, you know, the last 10 years. And it has a lot to do, of course, with the pandemic. Uh, they did great out of the pandemic. And, and, it's, and its profitability is important. So suddenly Netflix becomes a source of surplus value because it's pulling in subscriptions. You know, you wanna, you wanna watch these Netflix things, you have to pay, I don't know how much a month, uh, and you pay your subscription, you can end up, uh, and they're, they're, it's wonderful what they're doing right now is they're actually carving up all of those, uh, you know, platforms. And you now look and there are about 30 different platforms and you find the thing you want is one of these platforms over here and you haven't actually subscribed to that one. So you find yourself putting out another $25 or $9 or whatever it is to subscribe to that platform because you want to see that. So this is, this is the kind of, this is, this is the kind of world we have moved into. So there are transformations occurring in the nature of the product and how it's done. But when you think about something like Netflix, you think about the vast amount of fixed capital there is that lies behind it. I mean, all the television sets and the, and the, and the, and the radio towers and all the rest of it, so there's, 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 there's a lot there. And so this is, so, so the knowledge economy is terribly important in actually defining new forms in which commodities can be created and sold. And the monetization of these, these new forms has become uh, absolutely dramatic. I mean, when I read that sort of thing from Marx, who kind of said, well, you know, these things get taken over and, and, and capital comes in and actually colonizes all of these things. I'm a soccer fan, I like to watch soccer. And it's great now, uh, I can watch Liverpool uh, play soccer every time they play, but my God, do I have to pay for it? <laughs> and 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 of course, uh, you know, watching a soccer game, it's it's over. It's done in ninety minutes. So the turnover time of the of the of the experience is ninety minutes. So so this gets monetized, and now there are completely new uh, platforms which are emerging where you can find this game or that game and so on. So if you one of these people like me, you know, I've got to see my soccer game, what happens? 
I, I find myself caught in this, uh, in this situation. On the one hand, it's giving me access to all the gains I want. On the other hand, it's also monetizing it up to the hilt. And therefore, it's, it's able to, to gain surplus value uh, through through the the activities that that, that that they they set up. So, yeah, knowledge is, is is terribly important, but it always was important. It's very important, of course, in terms of technological change and, and organizational change. And again, we'll be looking more specifically at technological change later on, uh, and the knowledge basis of that of that change. But again, comes back to this kind of openness of the tech of the system. How fast things change. I mean, what are social needs? Uh, 20 years ago, you didn't need uh, a cell phone because cell phones didn't really exist. Now everybody has to have a cell phone and everybody's life is, is run around cell phones and what they're about and so on. So, so we live in this world where these transformations are occurring. And a lot of that has to do with scientific research, has a lot to do with knowledge production. Uh, but the question is always, how is that knowledge? going to be used to make a product of some kind which can be monetized in such a way as to contribute surplus value to the capitalist class. Anyone have any follow-up thoughts to that? Feel free to just come off mute. David, we have a question. Do you have any recommended readings um, in relation to what you just shared with us? Well, um, my recommended readings are the, what I'm going to write, <laughs> which is a bit, a bit self-indulgent. But, uh, but uh, I wanna, like I say, this uh, the text of this uh, will be sent out to people in the class. And uh, it will also be on my website, uh, davidharvey.org. And so every week we will put uh, the, uh, the text of this on the, the, the website, website so you can read it there as you want. And by the end of the semester, we'll have 12 sessions uh, on the website, kind of like a little sort of textbook. <laughs> and I hope it will be maybe used that way. We'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in people's kind of responses as to whether what I've been doing here has been too complicated, too abstract, too, you know, people have any kind of feelings about that. Because it's not only the content, it's also the mode of presentation that is important. I do, but I'd rather give other people some time. Um, I think, um, well, one, I had a question about the, the last example when you were talking about like the example of Netflix and the streaming economy. I was wondering if you could describe in that example where, what you see as the sites of production. Um, for example, like with the, with the soccer games, right? When things, are, when things are being monetized that have already been produced, where would you describe as additional production happening or would you use a different term to describe that? Um, well, I, I, I think it's in, it, important to separate production and realization. And the, the point of realization is not the same as the point of production. So a soccer game is being produced at a football ground in Europe. Uh, it's being watched by me in the United States. So my point of realization of, of, of that is changes in space and time. Now, again, this is something that's terribly important about the history of capitalism, which is the transformation of space-time relations, all of the time and, 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 the, and the like. Uh, so one of the things we can do is, is, is uh, have, have this possibility uh, of splitting the production and the appropriation. Now, in, the, in that, the production and the appropriation uh, are two different, uh, two different things. I take the, go back to the, the Apple computer thing. The, uh, most of the value is produced in the people making all the parts, and it's all assembled uh, by Foxconn in China, and then it's sold by, by, by Apple. Now, where the value is produced, it's produced back down the supply chain. Uh, okay, and, and the rate of profit of those supply chain merchants is probably very low. Foxconn, I was told, has a, a 
by the Financial Times suggested it had a, a, a profit rate of around three or four percent, whereas Apple had a profit rate of around 27 percent. So what you're seeing is the difference between where it's produced, where value is produced and where it's realized and who realizes it. And, and a lot of the time these days, it's of course the merchant capitalists who realize it as opposed to the producers. You see this in clothing, for example, uh, a lot that, uh, you know, stuff made in Bangladesh ends up being sold in, in the Gap or Walmart or wherever. And that's where the profit is realized, where the value is produced in Bangladesh. So what we've got is a lot of value transfer going on through the separation of, of production from realization, if that is, if that is what you're, you're getting at. But I think I maybe have misread your question. No, I mean, I think that's, I think that's helpful. I, di I didn't have as strong an understanding beforehand. So just expounding upon it is helpful. Um, and then my thoughts in terms of the like larger format of the class and structure of the class is just, I think it would be helpful if you could give uh, more of a larger overview over what the plan is for the semester and then how each of these different course classes will fit into that. Um, so I really, really enjoy hearing, hearing you um, explain and expand, but um, I had trouble understanding the direction. Yeah, well, well, actually, I've got trouble too because I'm not sure where it's going. At the uh, it's a bit, uh, you know. I, I mean, I, 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 I know that uh, about the first six sessions, and I have some uh, which we've already mentioned about the state, which I'm is really going to, uh, you know, give me anxiety like crazy. So I, so I, and I, and I may not be in a position to present that when I, uh, when it should logically be presented. So I may have to delay it or something. So I'm, I'm a bit bad about knowing exactly where it's going. I think where it's where where it is going is it's traversing, as it were, the terrain of Marx's thinking about all of these topics. So next week we were dealing with the question of the circulation of labour. Uh, then the week after that, and it'll really be about uh, absolute surplus value. Um, the week after that would be about the productivity of labor, um, which is about relative surplus value. So, so, so we, 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 we go from the terrain right now from to absolute relative surplus value. <clears throat> I'm then going to do something odd, which, um, which is to kind of ask the, the question of where Marx is getting most of his ideas from. And so I'm going to insert a week where I, where I talk about the inspiration. Uh, you know, what, what, where, where was he getting his information from? And to what degree was that um, biased? It's the wrong term, but it was situated in such a way as to give him a certain perspective on capital, which is unique to that, to that, that perspective. So I think there's some there's some some questions to be asked there, which we should all ask of ourselves. You know, to what degree do we interpret the world uh, out there in terms of what is happening in here, and we tend to sort of uh, project what we understand in here out there, and, and 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 so that is going on in political economy a lot of the time. And I want to ask that question about uh, about what Marx was learning from whom. Uh, and and how he learned it and, and and what that therefore led him to concentrate on as opposed to neglecting some other things like I think he you know, some of the topics that he that he wanted to deal with like the state like finance capital um, he could have dealt with and in some ways you wonder what his text would have looked like if it had started with that with those questions as opposed to ending with them and not completing them so I want to raise this kind of question as, we, as we're going through. Not, not, not in a mean way to criticize Marx and say, well, you know, he was just a uh, white European male doing, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but to kind of try to situate his knowledge and therefore to approach his ideas and, and my own ideas circumspectly in terms of, uh, you know, where, where the, the ideas are coming from. I've already mentioned I've been watching a lot of Netflix recently, as you could probably see. <laughs> so I'm thinking about the economy of Netflix. 
which is which is interesting. Okay. A lot of people in turn, and, and people think it comes out of the ether. Well, fixed capital around Netflix is huge. <laughs> and, and actually, the other the other one's great to look at is is cruise liners. They're selling experiences. How many people are employed on cruise liners? And what is a cruise? <laughs> There's things like things like that. I think you know are, are interesting. Uh, we're getting close, I think, to the end. I think here, um, right? So, um, I would encourage everybody to go and read the text and see what you make of it. Come up with questions about it. Make suggestions about presentation. Things that need elucidation and help. And uh, you can. You're going to be uh, sort of a. Uh, uh, I think I'll find that ex extremely helpful. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you, everyone.